Hi, guys, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silenced them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is Episode 10, Noah Tomlin. It has always enraged me when a parent reports their child missing only to be arrested and charged in the child's murder. It takes away some of the credibility of parents whose children have actually gone missing without their assistance. The most egregious case that comes to mind, of course, is that of Kaylee Anthony in 2008. I don't even want to get started on that case, though, because I might never stop raging about her mother's acquittal. The recent case of Evelyn Boswell is another one. And, of course, little A.J. Friend, the subject of my first post on SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com, as well as my first episode of this podcast, was reported missing by his parents just days before his father led police to his little body. It's a common tactic used by parents who intentionally or otherwise cause the death of a child, and sadly, too many of them get away with it. On June 24, 2019, Julia Tomlin reported her two-year-old son Noah missing, saying that when she awoke at about 11.15 a.m., he was gone from the family's mobile home in Hampton, Virginia. Investigators launched a massive search that spanned 10 days, caught the attention of national media, and involved several law enforcement agencies as well as concerned citizens. As the days passed, Julia's story began to unravel, and she was charged in his death after admitting that Noah was dead, his body disposed of like trash. Days later, Noah's partial remains were found near the city incinerator. What little was found of the tiny boy told a tragic story of long-term neglect and abuse. The more we learned about Julia's life, the more obvious it became that she should never have had custody of the three children in her care at the time of Noah's death. Despite extensive CPS involvement with the family, a prior jail sentence for felony child neglect, endless documentation of her drug and alcohol abuse, and several other red flags, Julia was indeed granted custody of the three youngest of her ten children, only for one of them to end up dead. This is the gut-wrenching story of Noah Tomlin. My sources for today's episode were the Hampton Police Division, CNN, WTKR News 3, Williamsburg Yorktown Daily, The Daily Press, WAVY, 13 News Now, ABC News, Crime Online, The Virginian Pilot, WUSA 9, WTOP, and Erica's Box of Chocolates blog. This will be the last episode in April, which is Child Abuse Prevention Month, but of course, we still need to remain vigilant. If you suspect a child you know is being abused or neglected, please speak up. These kids in quarantine with their abusers are at a higher risk than usual because they don't have contact with teachers, doctors, or other mandatory reporters who might otherwise make a report. Please don't stand idly by while any child is harmed, either physically or emotionally, or while a child's needs aren't being met. It's our responsibility as members of the human race to protect and advocate for the most vulnerable of our species. It's all too common in the cases I've covered that a parent who has, either intentionally or otherwise, caused the death of a child first reports the child missing before the truth is ultimately uncovered. Based on numbers provided by the Pauli Class Foundation, of abductions reported in 2016, for example, 96.5% were perpetrated by family members of the missing child or children. Furthermore, according to a report published by the Child Welfare Information Gateway, In 2016, parents, acting alone or with another parent or individual, were responsible for 78% of child abuse or neglect fatalities. More than one quarter, 27%, of fatalities were perpetrated by the mother acting alone. 16.8% were perpetrated by the father acting alone, and 20.1% were perpetrated by the mother and father acting together. Non-parents, including kin and child care providers, among others, were responsible for 16.7% of child fatalities, and child fatalities with unknown perpetrator relationship data accounted for 5.3% of the total. It's especially irritating to me when these parents reporting their child as missing have previously been accused or, as in this case, convicted of child abuse and or neglect. We're supposed to believe some random person slipped into your home in the middle of the night and kidnapped your kid after it's been documented that you spend your free time doing drugs, smacking your kid around, or worse? Tell me another one, Mom of the Year. Anyway, now that I've ranted a little, I'll get on with telling this story. Around 11.35 on the morning of Monday, June 24, 2019, 
34-year-old Julia Leanna Tomlin contacted the Hampton, Virginia Police Division and reported her two-year-old son, Noah, missing. According to Julia, who lived with three of her children in the Bayside Mobile Home Village, she put Noah to bed around 1 o'clock that morning. What, isn't that bedtime for most two-year-olds? She told investigators that when she put him to bed, Noah was wearing a green and white striped pajama shirt and a diaper. About 10 hours later, after she went in to check on him at 11.15, she found him missing. The Hampton police requested help from the Virginia Department of Emergency Management search team and the Virginia State Police Mobile Command Post. They also requested help from the FBI in the investigation. It's refreshing and unusual to hear of a law enforcement agency requesting assistance from other agencies right off the bat, and it really makes me respect the Hampton Police Division. Hampton Police Chief Terry Salt spoke at a press conference on Monday, the 24th, stressing how hard they were working to bring Noah home safely. Well, we have a missing child, two-year-old, that has been has not been seen since 1 o'clock in the morning. Reported missing at about 11.35. Uh, the child was put to bed last night, and uh, is, again, the parents have not, their mother has not seen the child since about 11.30 this morning when she reported uh, missing. Uh, we take these situations extraordinarily seriously, and uh, we are unable to locate the child after a number of searches. So we've called in additional resources at this point. Uh, we are uh, getting ready to escalate that even further. Uh, we will be having uh, assistance from the Virginia Department of Emergency Management search team. We requested some assistance from the uh, state police with their mobile command post. Uh, we've called now, just recently called in the FBI to assist with the investigative side of this. Uh, we're turning over every stone. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to bring this child home safely. Can you point out which home or apartment complex it was? Was it a home or apartment complex? I guess it's, a, it's actually a mobile home. A mobile home. And uh, generally in that direction. You're not giving that address right there. Right? That's correct. Right. And can, how many people uh, besides the mother and the child uh, live in the, in the mobile home? Were well, there? I'm not prepared to get into the details of okay. the investigation at this point. Uh, what we are doing is asking for the public's assistance in helping us locate the child. I believe we've put out information on that already, and uh, his picture is out there and available. Uh, you know, we're, we're considering everything from the child just walking away, but two years old should be able to walk too far, uh, to all the way up to including foul play. We're looking at all potential possibilities. Even an abduction possible? We're looking at, we're not ruling anything out until we find the child. And so we're going to take it as the worst case and hope for the best case. How's the mother handling all this? Uh, she's working with our detectives at this point and uh, trying to find a safe resolution to this as well. And it's safe to say she put, I guess, the child to bed at 1. Maybe she didn't wake up until 11.30 and that's when she noticed he was gone. Is that her? She that's reported, what we're trying to get she, yeah. she reported the child missing at 11.35 this morning. Other than that, details, uh, we know that she put him to bed last night about 1 a.m. Uh, but other than that, we're not prepared for any further details. While the first hours of the search took place, two forensic units were parked outside the Tomlin's mobile home, which was surrounded with crime scene tape. Reportedly, Noah's parents spent some time overnight at police headquarters. His father, whose identity was not initially publicized, was not a resident of the home, but had arrived after Julia reported Noah missing and was reportedly cooperating with the investigation. Reporters spoke with neighbors on the day Noah went missing. Can't understand it because the kids are never off the porch. If they are, usually she's off the porch. But she, she's got a gate that she locks and everything. My daughter and I, we walked because we wanted to look in the woods. We wanted to see if maybe the child had gotten out, gotten in the woods, laid down, and went to sleep. Um, kids are adventurous. The Hampton police released a photograph of Noah that immediately set off alarm bells in many people's minds. His disappearance took place in June, but the most recent photo his mother could provide was from the previous Halloween, almost eight months before. The picture showed an itty-bitty little boy with fine brown hair and big blue eyes strapped into a forward-facing car seat, staring into the camera with what looks like chocolate smeared around his mouth. He wore a blue Superman costume with a red cape and blue socks, and he held what looked like a green glow stick in one tiny hand. On Tuesday, June 25th, Search efforts continued on the ground as well as spreading to the air and the water. Police said at this time that they had not found any evidence Noah left the home of his own volition or was abducted. Hampton Police Sergeant Reginald C. Williams, who was designated as the public information officer for Noah's case, 
gave a press briefing that day. The investigation, it's basically uh, we're continuing our search um, and our tips to be as detailed as possible. Um, we have uh, completed multiple searches in multiple areas. And uh, in the searches, we're making sure that different people search the same areas multiple times. So we have uh, multiple eyes on every different scene and we can make sure that we um, vary our coverage of the search areas. We're continuing to reach out to uh, and utilize various uh, resources. We have UAV units in the air. We have divers in the water and uh, additional marine resources on the water as well. Um, we're continuing to expand and to um, just check different areas for what we're searching. To the best of my knowledge, we have gone all the way from salt ponds. Um, so basically all the way to salt ponds, uh, extending about a mile um, south of the uh, origin where the child went missing from. Our investigators are working diligently uh, to try to extract information from the parents and anybody that may have um, a lead on where this juvenile may be. Our concern is uh, just as high as it is now as it was in the very beginning. Uh, locating this juvenile is an extremely high priority for us. Um, we want to ensure that the juvenile returns home safely. We are considering every available option in this case. Um, we're exploring every possibility, um, whether it be from a potential abduction to uh, just a uh, missing juvenile. So we're uh, not leaving a stone uncovered in our attempts to find this child. We have, we've had people call in and we would ask them to continue to call in. If they see something that looks out of place, uh, we're going to certainly take that into consideration and that will certainly aid us in the investigation. With the water being so close to the, the point of origin, that's just one of the elements that we're taking into consideration. We are still f full capacity right now and I would anticipate to see that continue throughout the afternoon and evening hours. Uh, it weighs deeply on the officers. I mean, we're out here and we're putting everything that we have into locating this juvenile. So it certainly weighs on our hearts and minds as well as the hearts and minds of the community. We want to see this come to a positive resolution. We're not formally at this time seeking any uh, organized community search. We're grateful for their willingness to help and we are appreciative of that and we understand um, how it weighs on the community's hearts and mind as well. But at this time, uh, we're just continuing our search efforts uh, so we can document and remain organized in what we have and haven't covered. I'm under the understanding that the, head, uh, the parents are still at police headquarters speaking with investigators. We have two parents at police headquarters, but I'm not prepared to speak on the family dynamic. Obviously, we hope that this is, comes to a, res a resolution as quickly as possible, and it's a positive resolution, but um, we are prepared to exert whatever resources necessary to locate this child. I would expect the, that the community should anticipate seeing uh, a heavy police presence. Uh, you'll see people walking through your neighborhoods, going through your, um, perhaps going through your yards and knocking on your doors, asking if you have seen anything or allowing us to search your property. Uh, you may see UAV resources in the air, our drone units, uh, and you might see marine uh, resources and divers in the water. The division has handled missing children uh, reports. Um, in many cases, they come to a quick resolution because we put so much um, effort into locating children um, that are missing, uh, especially at this young of an age. Um, but this is the longest search for a missing child that I've seen in my career. In certain areas of this coastline, there are some muddy areas and uh, low-lying tidal areas that bring about a challenge, uh, but we are utilizing uh, a number of resources to overcome that challenge, and I think it's uh, being done very efficiently. Pocosin um, Police Department has offered a um, wind boat, an air boat, um, that allows us to navigate shallow tidal waters. Um, we also have uh, Hampton Fire out here with us um, that has provided waders um, for officers to search low-lying areas and our joint police and fire dive team is um, exploring various areas throughout the water that's accessible to divers. FBI uh, is assisting in an investigative capacity and state police has provided resources. Of course you see the command bus um, and we have additional resources in route as well. Community members trying to assist in the search spoke with reporters on day two. Trying to look for the baby. Yes, trying to help. We had a couple hours of free time and every minute counts. I couldn't. I couldn't imagine. I don't want to imagine. Somebody knows what happened. I don't care what they say. Somebody knows what happened. And so I really hope that if they're honest and, and they have kids, they would bring that baby back if they took it or tell somebody what happened. 
but I hope everything turns out for the best. It's, it's just a sad situation. Neighbor Jennifer Hunt told WUSA 9 that she knew both parents and was concerned because of their history, saying, The previous drug use, the previous problems, the previous child neglect and abuse with the other kids. I do question whether or not they should have been given custody of Noah. City spokeswoman Robin McCormick announced that trash collection in the area had been suspended, and reports were rampant of police being present at nearby Bethel Landfill. Chief Salt gave another press conference on Wednesday. First and foremost, uh, our concern and prayers are going out to the family of Noah Tomlin. What we know today has not changed much since uh, the uh, first announcement. Noah has been missing since June 24th. Since that time, an intensive search has been underway. In conjunction with that search, an intensive investigation has been underway. What we're here to update you on today is the search portion of our efforts to locate Noah. Again, we are still hopeful that we will find him safe and sound in some location, uh, but uh, we are looking at all potential aspects that this case could lead us to. Uh, We conducted a search with a lot of our partners, and we will give you a list of all the different agencies that have been involved in the search in the area of the neighborhood. Uh, We have looked on land, water, uh, we have checked uh, trash, dumpsters, we have checked neighborhoods, uh, houses, underneath uh, buildings, in sheds. We actually covered the area multiple times with different teams so that we would have different eyes checking the same locations repeatedly. This has been very intense over the last 48 hours, and I'm sure that you have been following that and following our crews around. There has been help on both the local, state, and federal levels. They're engaged in in, uh, both the uh, search efforts and on the investigative side, and uh, uh, we are making progress on the search side of things. Uh, Today, we have shifted our search efforts to the uh, landfill. There's no specific information that has led us to the landfill. But in past experience, we have found that we often have to search these areas. And so what we did in the planning aspects, we put it into five phases. We wanted to do four search phases locally to the, uh, the site where Noah went missing. And then this was always in the plan to come to this location. We planned for it early. We worked with our public works department to isolate trash where we wouldn't get into having to search an entire landfill. We also stopped trash pickup in the area uh, so that we could check trash before it was transported. But we know we always miss something. So this is the next phase. Again, we are still very hopeful that Noel will be found safely or uh, with, uh, and without harm and brought back home. We're not going to go into much detail on the investigation side at this point. We will do another update later that will focus a little bit more on that. But today, I wanted to make sure that we were transparent and letting you know why we are here. With that, we are on the investigative side working with local, state, and federal investigation. And that includes the state police, that includes uh, our investigators, but it also includes the FBI up to and including the Behavioral Science Unit associated uh, with the investigation. We are undergoing, we're leaving no leaf unturned. We're looking at everything from the child walking off to the abduction scenario. Uh, There's nothing that we're not looking at. And so we've got a lot of resources working in multiple different directions. To that end, uh, that's what we know at this point that we we can go into as far as the details. What you can do or what our our residents can do is be vigilant and looking out for Noah, talking with friends, see if they've seen anything, heard anything, let us know about that. Uh, and we will look into it. Uh, We're very much interested in any video, pictures, or anything from the surrounding area during the time frame of 1 a.m. Monday morning all the way through uh, today that might capture uh, anything to have to do with the case. There's someone out there that likely knows something. We need that piece of information to help guide us as well. We do have some things that we are working on, but again, we won't go into that right now. We have worked with the Port Authority uh, Marine uh, Maritime Response Team. We've worked with the Air Force OSI uh, resources and their security forces to assist Tidewater Search and Rescue, the uh, Virginia Port Murt Team. We're looking at the uh, Hampton Roads Incident Management Team, 
Chesapeake Fire Department has offered, has, has provided some assistance, York County Sheriff's Department, uh, again the FBI, Pocosin Police Department and Fire Departments. Uh, there's a myriad of resources that we have put into place. We have uh, done water searches with side scan sonar. We have used airboats to get into the tidewater areas, into the uh, marsh areas. Uh, we have searched those areas on foot. We have used aerial team, aerial drone teams from multiple jurisdictions to assist, as well as, uh, as I mentioned before, multiple repeated searches uh, in the immediate area. We are we, we do have a good partnership with the neighborhood app, and uh, we have found a lot of success in other cases with uh, that we are evaluating all those we have received some video whether or not they're of uh, evidentiary value at this point uh, we don't I, I can't speak to but we are looking at those aspects I can't I can't speak for the family at this point uh, I can just tell you that they have been very busy working with us and uh, we have d been very diligent in trying to locate other family members and that sort of thing to make sure the child is not with an extended family member or friend Right now we had kind of an isolated area that we were searching. It's not like a woodland search and we're dealing with a toddler that if it walked away and this toddler was not very mobile, could take a few steps, it'd fall down, pick up, take a few steps. And so it's kind of an isolated area. So we extended that well beyond the range a toddler could walk. And so right now we don't really have a need. There may come a time if we have another isolated search area that we will throw intense resources. All these folks that we're talking about, I've talked about the partnerships, are standing by ready to go again. And uh, we've had dogs involved, we've had multiple dog teams involved in this, and they're ready to go, but we need to have some information on where we might start looking. I have not personally sp spoken with the mother yet. She's been with investigators. She's developed a rapport with some of them, and so I'm kind of leaving it to them at this point. Uh, I would say that she's holding up as about as well as uh, you could expect under circumstances. Very early in the investigation, we actually did drone uh, search, searches over the landfill just to get a benchmark of where trash was and where it's not so we could isolate uh, uh, our search area so we could complete it very quickly and efficiently. We were also able to work with Public Works and a number of other folks to make sure that what trash that did come in from the area was isolated in a separate area so that we could actually complete that search very quickly as well. The longer we go, the more concerned we are for the child's safety, particularly if that child is alone. And uh, a, a two-year-old cannot care for itself. That's why this is so pressing. That's why you see so many resources that are involved in this. That's why we put you know, land, air, and sea uh, resources out to uh, cover it recover it, cover it again, and then cover it again, and then do a gap analysis and cover again on what we had maybe perhaps missed. We wanted accountability for every location, and that still that doesn't mean that we haven't missed something. We have actually consulted with uh, the uh, Virginia Emergency Management Division search and rescue teams, and they're very experienced in, in land searches in various different scenarios like um, Alzheimer's or, or, or mentally challenged or infants and things along those lines. And uh, so in consulting with all the different partners and all the expertise and the decades and years of experience they have in this, we're going by consensus of where we should be searching at this point with the limited information we have. You know, again, I won't go into the investigative details, but we are covering every individual who possibly could have the child, may have come by and picked up the child for the ch child's well-being. You know, a lot of that took time because there are people in state, out of state, who are relatives, acquaintances. We're literally contacting anyone and everyone that might have come in contact with a child or known about the child and maybe just wanted to care about the child and picked it up. You know, we're, we're not leaving anything to chance. The same day, Sergeant Williams spoke with a reporter to indicate that the landfill search did not mean police had given up hope of finding Noah alive. It's a step that we had planned from the very beginning that's going to um, just help us check off some boxes throughout the investigation. We are following up on leads and speaking to people um, that extend beyond the borders of Virginia. You've probably noticed I'm playing quite a bit of audio from Chief Salt and Sergeant Williams in this episode, and that's just because they seem to me like stellar examples of the way law enforcement should behave and the way investigations should be run. I'd have to say I'm officially a fan of the Hampton Police Division at this point. Somebody hooked me up with Chief Salt's merch website. I'd wear the shit out of a Team Chief Salt t-shirt.
On the night of Wednesday, June 26th, police were seen removing bags of possible evidence from the mobile home. Also on Wednesday, a reporter spoke with Yolanda Earle, who previously provided respite care for Noah as part of Becoming Families, an organization that advocates for foster families and children. Respite care is basically short-term relief for caregivers, giving them a temporary break from the child or vulnerable adult they care for. Noah is a very happy, mobile young man. When I first saw it on the news, like my whole body started shaking because I knew who he was. He, he broke my TV, and that's how I remember him. Each situation is different, and each case is different, and we got we to gotta do something better. All of us. Bring Noah home. He has a family that loves him, not just his biological family, but his foster families, his respite providers, people that have been in his life for the last two years. Late on Wednesday, Julia Tomlin released a statement via text to 13 News Now anchor Dan Kennedy that read, I'm working real hard with law enforcement to help find my baby. I can't have my location known or whereabouts of my other children for their safety. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Usually when a child goes missing, the parents go right on TV to plead for their kid's safe return. This one's in hiding. For what? Julia texted the reporter again on Thursday afternoon, saying, He doesn't walk well. His pediatrician said there are signs of him being autistic. He walks but still stumbles. She reported that her other children were safe and that Noah belongs home. His family loves and misses him. Julia didn't have much of a chance to propagate more alleged bullshit via the media because on Friday, June 28th, the Hampton Police Division held a press conference at 11 p.m. to inform the public that Julia had been charged in her son's disappearance and, tragically, that police presumed the two-year-old boy to be dead and planned to ramp up their search efforts to locate his body. Tonight, our hearts and prayers continue to go out to the loved ones uh, and, uh, of Noah Tomlin and for Noah Tomlin. What you have not witnessed is the intensive investigation going on behind the scenes. This continues to be a a two-pronged process on both the search and investigative efforts, but tonight we are announcing an arrest related to the disappearance of Noah Tomlin. We are arresting Julia Lena Tomlin, 34-year-old Hampton woman, the mother of Noah, in connection with his disappearance. Charges are pending. Unfortunately, to date, Noah has not been found. Based on the highly coordinated investigation, we continue, we believe him to be deceased. This leaves us a little bit speechless, but the search for Noah continues. We'll never give up hope. The Hampton Police Division, along with the Hampton Fire Department and our agency partners, are intensifying our search efforts to find Noah with a more specific focus starting now. As the investigation is ongoing and in a very critical stage at this moment, there's very little information that we can share in addition to what I'm providing. We ask that everyone keep Noah and those that love him in your hearts and your thoughts as our officers and agents continue their tireless efforts to find them. I also ask that you consider the efforts that these officers and agents and firefighters have been through this week. It's been intense heat. It's been long hours. And every single one of them have been dedicated to this mission. I can tell you that I've been in this business 45 years and I could not be prouder to be associated with the men and women who carry a badge, whether to firefighter, police officer, or federal agent. They have done a remarkable job and there's still a lot to do. I can tell you that investigation has led us to that uh, conclusion. I cannot go into investigative details at this point. You know, I've been tracking social media, and part of the investigation we're tracking social media, and there's so many people that are hurt by this. You know, when you look at NOAA, when you look at the victims, any youth victim, and we've seen this before, uh, our hearts go out. Everybody bleeds. I mean, it's like there are people out there in the community who would be willing to take care of a child uh, and make sure something like this doesn't happen. But at the end of the day, it affects the police officers and the first responders as well. It's the emotion in their face through all the dirt, the filth, the tiredness, you know, from searching landfills and all the other stuff. Uh, 
the investigations that go on 24 hours a day, the fatigue that can set in, but nobody wants to drop it. They just want to continue to go. They want to push it. They want to get to the conclusion. They want to find Noah. And, you know, we all pray that we still find him safe, but that's just not the way it's pointing at this point. Her other children are being taken care of. Uh, we have uh, Child Protective Services involved, and uh, we're making sure that they are safe. Some are with family members and have been for some time. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, that's, that is one of our number one priorities, make sure they're okay. We'll have, we'll have more information for you tomorrow. I can tell you that we're moving into a 24-hour oper a day operation phase because it is going to focus, and that focus will begin in the morning. Julia Tomlin was booked into the Hampton Jail at 3.30 a.m. on Saturday, June 29th. If you haven't seen her absolutely ridiculous, pathetic, pouty mugshot, you must go see it. It's included in the Facebook photo album I put up for this episode on the podcast page. A Bring Noah Home vigil was held on the evening of June 29th near the James T. Wilson Fishing Pier. A local woman named Lydia White, who didn't know Noah or the Tomlin family, organized the event. I have a two-year-old, and I mean, one time she went out the back door. Luckily, you know, gated, the gates are locked, but still, like, just for five seconds not knowing where she was, was absolutely heartbreaking. So I can't imagine... Community members who attended the vigil wore green and white, the color of the pajama shirt Noah was reportedly wearing when he went missing. People left poems, messages, and prayers. The vigil also served as a call for justice after the public found out Noah's mother had been arrested the night before. Religious leaders led prayers as the collection of white candles below a tree bearing a photo of Noah grew throughout the evening. Noah's former foster mother, Barbie, spoke at the vigil. After listening to her talk, I think you're going to love this woman as much as I did. She was on oxygen and in a wheelchair, but I have to wonder if that's just because her heart is too enormous for her to carry it all by herself. You guys, a lot of people don't know me. I've been anonymous this whole week. We got Noah you. is my baby. I had a lady text me last night, the woman who brought him to me, and she told me that she refers to me as the mother of many. When I was 20 years old, I gave birth to my daughter. And I asked God, why can I never have any more babies? I had another one. And his name is Noah. That baby never called me anything but mommy. I've tried to remain anonymous. But if you heard the news channel with the caregiver who took care of Noah, the one memory, thought, care I've got of that baby is he crawled up on my couch the first night that I got him. And he looked at me and just smiled never seeing me a day in his life and I said no we'll stay up all night long if you want to and we did bless his little heart and blue eyes you couldn't tell him no although I call him no no because that's all he said was no no <laughs> but he sat on the couch with me and held my hand and he just grabbed my hand like as if to say I know I'm safe this whole week has been I don't want to sell hell, there's a preacher here, but it's been awful, y'all. I just now came out of the house yesterday because I missed that baby. That baby couldn't walk. All he could do was crawl around the house. The army couldn't crawl as good as that baby. <laughs> <laughs> but for the short time that we had him, he was loved. He was loved dearly. My daughter has been sick as a dog. She's had to take off work this whole week. Thank God I don't work. All I've done is embrace my grandkids, embrace any baby I can get. You got one, you can't take care of it, bring it to me. If anybody had Noah, bring him, drop him off in a crowd somewhere. He'll crawl up to you, he'll hug you, he'll kiss you, and he'll say, Mommy, you need to call Ma, that's what my grandkids call me. Somebody knows how to get in touch with Ma. Ma will get that baby. He don't have to have a stitch clothes on. He don't have to have nothing. I don't have no money, but I've got a heart. Amen. And the one thing I want to say, and this is really bothering me, there's so many children in this world and in this country that are being neglected, that are being looked over. Somebody has got to do something about CPS. But anybody, if you know, if you think 
that a child is being mistreated? If you notice something, anything, just the teeniest thing, it's better to say something. Open your mouth. Something's got to be done. I don't have any hate for anybody. I don't have the word hate in my heart. I don't hate anybody. If you need to eat, you call me. I'm going to find you some food. You need clothes, I'm going to find you clothes. That's just me. This isn't the time to hate. This isn't the time to do anything. But praise God that little Noah was loved. He may have only been two years old. But look at all the people standing out here. We got to stand together, y'all. We've got to stand together. Because that baby, if I could take him and his two little, the younger siblings that I had as well, they'd be in my house right now. And if anybody watching, if they need to come to Ma, Ma's got the house open. The door is open. You don't have to bring them nothing but me and them babies. Because I'll rock them, I'll love them, I'll teach them about Jesus, and we'll just have a grand old time. <laughs> We've all got to stand up. If more people would come out to the city halls like this, if that's what it takes, get out there. I may not physically be able to just get out there and do stuff all the time, but there's plenty of people in this crowd who can. You know, we, just, we need to make a difference. Hug your babies. Hug your babies. Thank y'all for listening. I'm sorry. Sometimes when the Lord tells you to talk, you just can't shut up. <laughs> the final speaker of the evening was Noah's 15-year-old sister, Leanna, who had only met Noah two weeks before his disappearance. I'm sorry, Noah, wherever you are. I wish I could have met you sooner. Julia was arraigned in court on Monday, July 1st, exactly one week, almost to the hour, after she reported Noah missing. She was initially charged with three counts of felony child neglect. She reportedly limped into the hearing, during which she requested a court-appointed attorney. Julia told the judge she was disabled and received a disability payment of about $771 per month. It was later revealed that Julia had issues with heroin and alcohol dependency, as well as diagnoses of bipolar, attention deficit, and post-traumatic stress disorders. According to Sergeant Williams, searches were planned to continue over the next several days, including the July 4th holiday. The search would remain focused at the city landfill and the Hampton NASA steam plant, where some refuse from the landfill was burned to produce energy for the nearby NASA Langley Research Center. The steam plant was closed to the public, and a sign at the plant's entrance informed visitors that the plant would not be accepting trash until further notice. It was soon discovered that Julia had a prior conviction for child neglect from nine years prior to Noah's disappearance. On April 30, 2010, while Julia, then age 25, and her baby daddy, Justin Samuel Jones, age 28, were distracted by another child, one of them placed their one-year-old daughter on the kitchen stove. She apparently fell backward onto one of the scorching hot burners. It wasn't until four days later when police, medics, and Child Protective Services convened at the family's apartment in Newport News, Virginia, regarding a case of possible child abuse, that the baby was taken to the hospital where her injuries were treated, including burn welts and blisters on her back, shoulders, and the back of her arms in a pattern consistent with an electric stove burner. According to the Newport News Police Department, the apartment was also filthy and in total disarray with clothes, toys, and other items strewn about in the bedrooms and in the hallway. Both Julia and Justin were arrested and charged with felony child neglect. It's unclear what Justin's sentence was, if anything, but Julia pleaded guilty and was sentenced to five years in jail with all but five months suspended. Court records show that Julia already had five children at the time of the incident. Before she went to jail, Julia signed away her parental rights to three of her children to Justin's parents, Cindy and Vincent Jones, who still have custody of their three biological grandchildren to this day. It's been reported that Noah was placed into foster care shortly after he was born. 19-year-old Rosie Hewitt told a reporter in 2019 that she had briefly been in foster care with Noah. She remembered riding in the car weekly with Noah and his older brother for hour-long visits with Julia at the social services office. There is no publicly available documentation that gives any insight on the reason Noah was placed into foster care or when and why Julia regained custody of him. As for Justin, here's some interesting information. Justin Samuel Jones is a registered sex offender. Justin was convicted in 2008 of sexual battery of a girl who was 13 or 14 years old at the time. That would have made him about 26. 
he didn't spend any time in jail for that offense. On June 25, 2019, the day after Noah's disappearance was reported, Justin was arrested on a charge of violating probation imposed in York County and booked into the Virginia Peninsula Regional Jail. He was also charged with a felony second offense for failing to register as a sex offender. He has actually been convicted four times for failing to register or providing false information. In another example of how the hell do these people keep finding each other, it was soon disclosed that Justin is Noah's biological father. With these two as parents, this kid never had a chance. Police didn't initially release Justin's name because he wasn't a suspect in the investigation. He wasn't involved in Noah's life because he didn't find out Julia was pregnant until after he moved to California. According to his mother, Cindy, Justin only returned to Virginia on June 22nd, two days before Julia reported Noah missing. The timing of Justin's return in conjunction with Noah's disappearance is evidently a coincidence. Absolutely nothing investigators have released so far points to Justin's involvement. Julia has other arrests under her belt as well. In 2009, she was charged with assault and battery of a family member after an argument with another man she had children with turned physical. The criminal complaint stated that the man who had just broken up with Julia ended up with scratches and cuts on his face and arms. The charges were dropped a few months later. Then, on October 30th, 2010, apparently before she received her jail sentence, Julia was arrested for and later found guilty of being drunk in public and resisting arrest. Through a FOIA or Freedom of Information Act request, it was discovered that multiple 911 calls were made from the mobile home where Noah lived with his mother, Julia, at 191 Atlantic Avenue in Hampton over the six months prior to Noah's death totaling 29 pages of communications list of events and a 58-page communications events report. Because Noah's death is still under investigation, the city declined to release the records to the media, so it's still unknown why all of these 911 calls were placed. I would imagine we'll find out more once Julia goes to trial. On Wednesday, July 3, 2019, Hampton police gave a press conference, somberly announcing that the remains of a child they believed to be Noah were discovered at 8.50 on Wednesday morning at the city's steam plant. On uh, Monday, June 24th, as you know, uh, Noah Tomlin was reported missing. That report began an intensive uh, two-level operation, which included a search and investigative phase. Information gained through the investigation helped focus the search efforts. Conservatively, we've spent over 10,000 man hours on this, this process. We have been through 1,000 tons, and let me put that in perspective, that's 2 million pounds of garbage and search that by hand. The priority all along has been to find Noah. It's with very mixed emotions that we report today that goal has been accomplished. At 8.50 a.m. this morning, a search team located the remains of a child we believe to be Noah Tomlin. Investigators, forensic technicians, and the medical examiner's office are currently processing the scene for formal confirmation and identification. The investigation is also being coordinated uh, through the Commonwealth's Attorney's Office, but there's still much to be done. The case will begin to transition to the Commonwealth's Attorney, Anton Bell, and the courts. Hampton Police Division will continue to support. Make no mistake, this has taken a toll on our community and our first responders. It will take time for all involved to recover and to heal. I want to thank the men and women of the Hampton Police Division and Fire Department. Those who investigated and searched for thousands of hours in the worst conditions imaginable. I have witnessed their blood, their sweat, and yes, even their tears this past week and particularly today. Their professional dedication and more importantly their caring has simply been amazing and every citizen should be proud of what they have accomplished and what they go through. I know I certainly am. If this tragedy, tragedy has taught us anything, it has taught us that we are united as a community in the fight against injustice. Noah is the epitome of an innocent victim. He, like all innocent victims, deserve better. The innocent deserve to have and have our promise 
that we will do everything in our power to prevent something like this from happening again. They also have our promise that we will hold those accountable who do harm to the innocent. To all of those who care for Noah, our hearts are with you and our prayers are with you. Noah is now in a better place. The remains were, they were not incinerated. I mean, this is a strange question, but they were not incinerated. Right? No, they were not. The, the scene is still being processed. Uh, once the search teams uh, located Noah, everything was frozen and it was uh, now treated as a, a crime scene and has to go through the formal process. You're dealing with conditions that are high humidity, high temperature. Uh, in this case, at the steam plant, they're in a confined space. We're dealing with uh, CO2 levels, we're dealing with methane gas, we're having to monitor those constantly and shut down operations as those uh, uh, rise too high, so we're constantly monitoring that. You're dealing with the emotional part of this. I mean, this affects people, this affects our officers. And you know, when you get into that and you smell the odors and, and you're in the midst of everything, and then you realize what you're there for, and you're going through literally millions of pounds of garbage, it takes tolls. You know, we've got officers that got half his picture on their uh, on the, the their card the, uh, on the dash of their car. We have officers that have them on their him on our clipboard. You see our picture here that has been with the investigators throughout the whole investigation. You know, at the end of the day, we care, and we want the community to know that. And it really takes a toll. Uh, to that end, we have uh, critical incident stress management counselors uh, working with our teams that have been out there. Um, and working with those involved in the case. And there are officers who are shedding tears. You know, I was holding one of our employees in my arms this morning that was, that was crying. They relate to other cases in their career. They relate to, relate to other experiences. They have children themselves. Uh, and the community is affected by this. And, you know, we all have to come together and heal. Most importantly, we need to address those who do harm to the innocent. But this is about Noah and it's about closure. It's about making sure that, you know, you know his life was respected and that uh, we can bring closure not only for him and his family, but for the community. On Saturday, July 13th, the Virginia Department of Forensic Science and the Medical Examiner's Office confirmed to the Hampton Police Division that the remains found at the city steam plant on July 3rd were indeed those of Noah Tomlin. Members of the community reacted to the news that Noah's body had been found. They deserve to have a childhood and play and be happy, and he was robbed of that. I'm sad because it's he's they found him, you know, dead. And but I'm angry. It's heartbreaking that a child has to live like that and die like that, and and have that kind of you know. Every child deserves to be loved. I've talked to a lot of people in this neighborhood who is hurting very bad. He was a sweet little boy, sweet little boy. It's devastating, but I'm I'm glad it's over. Now they can you know, follow up and get a cause of death. On July 15th, Noah's grandparents, Cindy and Vince, and his oldest sister, 15-year-old Leanna, spoke to a reporter about Noah. They only had the opportunity to meet Noah once, just days before his death. We've been telling her, if you, you want to feel better, you have to forgive her. And it's, it's hard, it's not, especially when you're a teenager and your hormones run crazy. I, I just tell her, run deep. her feelings are okay. It's going to take a long time for her to even start healing about this. I, I can't even imagine what she would be thinking. Noah's already in a better place. An innocent life taken too soon. I mean, I, it's still hard to wrap my head around, but... It's been very hard. It was good to get to know him. Wow. He's very sweet. I was shocked, and but the more we were looking at it, the more I knew she was involved in it somehow. Just think about, like the positive parts about the situation, like Noah's no longer suffering. The system did fail Noah. The, the system did fail Noah. I wish I could have known him the way that I know my other grandchildren, but we will know each other sometime, someday. Also on July 15th, a tree on First Street in Buckrow Beach that had been fashioned into a memorial for Noah caught fire, resulting in the Hampton Fire Department responding to the blaze around 2.30 a.m. Officials didn't believe the fire was set intentionally, saying it's possible a candle was not fully extinguished or a cigarette ash near the tree could have sparked the fire. Unfortunately, all of the stuffed animals left in Noah's memory were burnt and had to be thrown away, in addition to plants, signs, and other items. 
Volunteers spent the day attempting to repair and restore the memorial, saying the fire would not prevent them from honoring Noah. Noah's paternal grandma, Cindy, spoke to a reporter near Noah's tree while community members worked to rebuild the memorial. Leanna, she's, um, she's taking all of this very hard. And the, the tree's really been a, a symbol. It's a symbol of love. The tree was, is a beautiful symbol of the community coming together. I was pretty upset. I was pretty upset because I know I can come out to this tree anytime I want, and there's there's somebody here. There's always somebody here for us. That's that's what that tree means to us. We're going one day at a time. We're trying to um, we're trying to piece together everything. I want answers. We know who can pro- provide the answers to us. So that's what we're waiting for. I'm saving my questions for court. I'm pretty sure that everything that needs to be answered will be answered. Quiet, loving, cute, blue eyes like crazy. Very quiet. Kind of, I want to say like young for his age, like laughed. He laughed a lot. He just looked like a little cute, cuddly baby. Like you just, if, if you seen him at the supermarket, you'd walk up and go, oh, what a cute little baby, you know, and you'd talk to him. That's, that's the kind of baby he was. It is heartwarming to think about all of the community members who have dedicated themselves to maintaining Noah's memorial, especially for the sake of those who knew and loved him, considering most of the people maintaining the memorial never met him. On July 17th, Cindy and Vince were named as Noah's legal next of kin. In late July, Cindy released a statement, which read, I know everyone is wondering why Noah's father and family have stayed quiet throughout this past week of hellish speculation, conjecture, and innuendo. Nevertheless, we are now prepared to speak out and explain our position on why we have remained in the background until now. Additionally, before we relay our sentiments on this shocking and horrendous situation that two families find themselves entangled, everyone needs to remember that Noah had nine, yes, nine siblings that are also innocent victims. And it is because of the other nine children involved that we ask the public to take care with what they post on social media, as the older children are privy to everything that is being posted And it is severely upsetting, adding to the stress of them finding out their brother has died at the hands of their mother. Please have care and think before you post and ask yourself, would I want my child to read this if the tables were turned? We have chosen to remain silent until now because we have Julia Tomlin's three oldest children. We adopted them in 2011 after she signed away her parental rights before going to jail after being convicted of felony child abuse. We adopted the three older children, who are our grandchildren, and who we fostered for six months prior to the adoption's finalization. There is also a set of twins, one of which was the victim of the stove burn. The twins found a new life and home with an unknown family. There are also three more boys who all reside with their fathers. The baby is now in foster care, and we pray that she finds a loving family. All in all, it is the nine other children that everyone should consider in the aftermath of the tragedy. Please be sensitive in what is said and or written. People can speculate, spew hatred and venom, or they can opt to send prayers and well wishes. Until the entire situation comes to light and the truth in its entirety comes out, please understand that the children are wounded and devastated. It was our true belief and hope beyond hope that Noah would be returned home safely and that his disappearance was nothing more than a sickening prank that had gone awry. We sincerely thought that Julia had arranged to have someone hide Noah as a means of upsetting Noah's father and getting back at him for changing his plans of going to her house the morning of his return. Instead, he decided to come straight to see his parents and older three children on his return to Virginia from California on Saturday, June 22nd. Noah's father had been residing in California for the past two years and did not find out about Julia's pregnancy until after he had moved for work. We genuinely believe that Julia was vying for attention as it would not be the first time that Julia had caused drama and chaos for unseen slights. Unfortunately, our worst fears came to fruition, as we all found out this past Wednesday, July 3rd. There is much more of this story to be told, but as I asked of you all, I must abide by my own wishes and not post anything that would be hurtful to the children. I do want to say that our hearts are broken and the sadness is stifling. There is a cloud of sorrow over our home. We pray that all who have sent love and support to us know that it has been a great comfort to our family to know that so many people care. Additionally, for those who have sent donations, we wish only to see Noah's siblings be the beneficiaries and recipients of the goodwill of the public, who has been so very generous. Thank you so very much, Cindy.
13 News Now spoke by telephone to Justin Jones, who told the reporter he did not know Noah was his son until he took a paternity test after the little boy's death. He said he suspected it might be the case, but Julia told him he wasn't the father and never to contact her again. Justin said Julia's drug use was the reason they broke up in the first place and that had he known that Noah was his son, he would have fought for full custody for that reason. Justin did not want the news station to publish his name or photo because of some of the comments he had already received online from people blaming him for not saving Noah from Julia. I would imagine his sex offender status is another reason he didn't want his name and picture out there. I am only using his name because it has been published in multiple outlets since then. The reporter asked Justin if he thought things would be different if he had known he was Noah's father to begin with. I know they would have been different. I got people blaming me for his death, saying I should have been there and should have done something. Well, how can I do something if I didn't know he was mine? No, I'm beyond angry. So I would have taken full custody away from her because of her drug use. In my opinion, she should rot beneath the jail. At a bond hearing on July 29th, Commonwealth's attorney Anton Bell described Julia as unstable, a flight risk, and a danger to the community. Julia's public defender, Althea Mies, argued that Julia does not have a long criminal history and is not a danger to anyone, although I'm guessing the daughter she went to jail for burning on the stove might have a different opinion on the subject. Noah might, too, if he had the opportunity to voice it. Julia's bond request was denied, and she was remanded back to the Hampton Roads Regional Jail. She still faced only three charges of felony child neglect, although Anton Bell said that further charges were being considered, pending the final report from the medical examiner's office. According to court documents released in October, investigators swabbed several suspected bloodstains in and around the Tomlin home. On one item of clothing tested, a red polo shirt in size 5T, blood was present in six separate stains. Blood was also present in nine different stains on a bedsheet. DNA testing eliminated Julia as a contributor to the stains, as well as Noah's two siblings who lived in the Buck Row Beach home. Noah's DNA could not be eliminated as a contributor to the blood found. The results of Noah's autopsy, performed by the Hampton Coroner's Office, were released on October 31st, and the information in the report was fucking horrifying. Prosecutor Anton Bell held a press conference to announce two additional charges against Julia Tomlin, second-degree murder, and unlawful disposal of a body. Sometime in the latter part of September of this uh, 2019, my office received a copy of the autopsy and the anthropology report concerning Noah Tomlin. In that report, we were advised of the nature and characteristics of his death, And as such, we are updating the public today as to the cause of death, as well as any updates to the case. According to the autopsy report, the cause of death of Noah Tomlin is blunt force trauma, as well as batter child syndrome. In reading the autopsy report, Specifically, I want to quote certain areas so that the public has a clear understanding as to the nature of the severity of the injuries that were suffered by Noah Tomlin. When the body was received by the medical examiner, it was in a state of advanced decomposition. And as a result of that, an anthropologist was brought on board to Uh, help with the conducting of the medical autopsy. The liver was the only thing that was recognizable. In addition to that, the left leg was recognizable. There were severe uh, bruises to that left leg, which were indications of some form of abuse. When the forensic anthropology analysis was conducted, the following conclusions were made. That there were severe fractures uh, to the skull. There was flat, uh, excuse me, fatal blunt trauma without any indication of healing. Now, I want to be very clear, the level or severity of the blunt force trauma to 
the skull was so severe. Uh, in speaking to Dr. Gunther about the severity, she stated that the type of injury that this child suffered was the same as if a child that had fallen several stories from a building. So this injury was not only severe, but um, just horrific, to say the very least. In addition to that, there were several chronic battering injuries that were discovered. Uh, to quote the medical examiner, there was also evidence of chronic battering with extensive healing, uh, jaw fractures, and three healing posterior rib fractures. So there were injuries to the jaw that had began to heal. There were injuries to the ribs that had begun to heal as well. Um, none of those things were the sole cause of death. However, they were contributing factors in the death of Noah Tomlin. Uh, to say the least, the nature of the abuse um, was of such a nature that clusters of Harris lines in each distal tibia and radius were discovered. Now, in plain language or layman terms, these are the type of injuries that you will find that will literally stop the growth of bones due to either some severe uh, disease such as cancer or um, some type of abuse or even severe malnutrition. So his abuse was of such a nature that um, literally his bones stopped growing and there were evidence of that. So as a result of her findings, her cause of death in her report is blunt head trauma in addition to battered child syndrome. As a result of the findings of the medical examiners, I have authorized today Hampton Police Department to secure a warrant for murder of Noah Tomlin against Julia Tomlin. In addition, I have authorized the Hampton Police Department to secure a warrant for the unlawful disposal of a deceased person. There were um, injuries that were healing, and so we know that some of those injuries could be from days to actual weeks. But there are indications that they were uh, not necessarily fresh. The injury that caused the death were two fractures to the skull. Those injuries had not healed at all. And as a result, we know that they were absolutely the cause of death. Now, to be a little bit more specific, uh, because I had a very detailed conversation with the medical examiner, and I asked her, I said, could these injuries be caused by, let's say, a child who hit their head on a table or a child who had fallen um, like walking and fell or even fell down some stairs. She said, no, if that was the case, most uh, children would not make it to adulthood to have this severity of injuries. I have been prosecuting for more than 20 plus years and um, I've, I've seen some very graphic things. I've seen some um, very horrific crime scenes and I've even actually gone to a autopsy being performed and nothing really uh, kind of grabs you like seeing a child or a toddler being the victim of a crime particularly something as horrific as this particular crime there's no question in uh, my mind based on the evidence this child was tortured this case is fluid uh, as such there are multiple moving parts but right now, uh, we are looking solely at Julia Tomlin as far as the murder charge. We do know someone helped her dispose of the body. There's no question about that. The question is the intent uh, and, and whether the person had knowledge that there was a body in the bag. The body was in a state of advanced de uh, decomposition. So um, basically, and, and I hate to be gruesome with the uh, specifics, but imagine a item that has a pamper wrapped around it and one leg 
and some muscle. That's it. We have bone fragments. So when the medical examiner did her uh, examination, she also brought in an anthropologist. This anthropologist literally pieced together the bone fragments of Noah Tomlin for them to be able to examine uh, whether there were any injuries to the skeletal frame. That's how we were able to establish the, um, the uh, fractures to the skull, the fractures to the jaw, the rib fractures, and because the leg was still, one of the legs was still intact, we were able to see the bruising that was on that leg that was consistent with abuse. Given the nature of the severity of the injury outside of hitting that child with a blunt object or literally taking that child and swinging that child and hitting his head against another blunt object, I don't see how that injury could have been sustained otherwise. Justice looked like Julia Tomlin being held fully accountable for the death of her son. And to me, that's prison. She should never, ever get the opportunity to ever hold another baby or to ever be in a caretaker role with another child of any nature. Was she a danger to children? Absolutely. Was she a risk being in a caretaker role with other children? Absolutely. No question about it. Uh, so do I feel that the ball was dropped? Again, it's not my, my place to say, but clearly she should not have been in a position to be caretaker of anyone's child. Uh, in addition, I would like to take the time to thank the Hampton Police Department who did an outstanding job in um, this investigation. We would not be where we are today, but for the countless hours um, and the sacrifice of the officers. In addition, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, they also came in and assisted us with the investigation and with the search and, and even being able to uh, really obtain uh, some uh, very um, incriminating statements from the defendant. So we'd like to thank them as well. What she said, based upon the medical evidence, is absolutely impossible. Bell and his office believe Julia's friend, later named as Timothy Carter, may have helped her conceal Noah's death by driving his body to a dumpster in Buckrow Beach. Even so, no one else has been charged in connection with the little boy's murder. Bell said the other person may not have realized they were helping dispose of a body. Julia was arraigned on her two additional charges on Monday, November 4th. On December 9th, during a probable cause hearing in Hampton Juvenile and Domestic Relations Court, 14 witnesses were called to testify in front of Judge Robert Wilson V to determine whether the case would be seen by a grand jury. Law enforcement personnel were present to testify about the landfill search, during which they used rakes to poke through the tons of garbage near the city's incinerator. Officer Jared Washington testified that the searchers were handing each bag to a sergeant to cut the bag open. Officer Washington found one such bag, which his sergeant opened with a box cutter, revealing a cardboard box. He said he was overwhelmed by the smell, and when he opened the box, he found Noah's partial remains inside. He described to the court in great detail the smell and the sight, which he said forced him outside. Another witness, Brad Bailey, was the father of Julia's then three-year-old son, Samuel, who he told the court was in foster care until about a year prior. He said that a few days before she reported Noah missing, Julia called him multiple times in one day, asking him to bring her some heroin, telling him it was because she was in pain, her health was bad, her liver was failing, and that she needed the opiate to help her clean up her house before a visit from Child Protective Services. To quote Brad, A bunch of bullcrap if you ask me. I've never done heroin personally, but from what I know about it, it is not the drug you need to motivate you to clean your house. Brad testified that he brought about $20 to $30 worth of heroin to Julia at about 1 to 1.30 p.m. on June 22nd, at which time he saw Noah briefly in the living room with Sammy and Julia's youngest child, then six-month-old daughter Cheyenne. Brad said he spent most of the visit with his son. She had called me the night before and about 10 times in that day trying to get me to get her heroin. Hurting, I should say, like she, was, she wasn't able to clean her house. So she needed me to provide her this so she could clean her house to make it suitable for child enforcement. My focus wasn't on Noah, but he was there in the living room. 
Another witness, Brian Knoll, said he stopped by Julia's trailer home a little after 7 p.m. that evening with the intention of meeting and introducing his daughter to Noah because at the time there was some indication that Brian might be Noah's father. Brian dated Julia from 2013 until about 2016, and he testified that he and Julia were reacquainted in April of 2019. When he and his daughter arrived at the trailer, Julia told Brian that Noah was asleep and she would not allow him to peek in just to see the little guy. Anyway, we can just maybe, me and my daughter can just peep in. We won't wake him, you know, to see no. And again, Julie responded that, well, he's asleep. Sergeant Curtis Crouch, who initially interviewed Julia at Hampton Police Headquarters at about 2.50 p.m. on the day she reported Noah missing, testified to some of the details she provided him. She said the kids had been up late eating chocolate and went to bed at 1 a.m., Noah in his own room, Sammy and Cheyenne in Julia's. She said she woke up in the middle of the night to feed Cheyenne, but did not check on Noah at that time, and when she woke up around 11.15 a.m., he was missing, his blanket on the floor. She thought someone must have taken Noah because she didn't think he could have walked that far on his own. Julia told Sergeant Crouch that she thought Noah might have autism because he rocked back and forth to self-soothe, banged his head at times, and was slow to reach some of his developmental milestones, such as walking and talking. Detective Matthew Chapman from the Crimes Against Persons Unit testified that when he interviewed Julia on June 25th, she was unable to give many details about the weekend, other than telling him her friend Tim Carter had brought her beer and cigarettes. Although she canceled an interview with Detective Chapman on June 27th, she showed up for one on June 28th, accompanied by her friend Tim. Briefly, she spoke with Detective Chapman before being interviewed by an FBI special agent, Liza Ludovico, who testified that it took hours for Julia to provide any detail because she deflected questions and behaved oddly, sitting with her feet in the chair and occasionally rocking back and forth. The agent testified she struggled at moments in the interview. Agent Ludovico said she showed Julia some of the evidence investigators had collected, such as proof of an early morning phone call to Tim Carter, a Walmart receipt for garbage bags and off-brand odor cleanser, and another phone call to Tim. The agent said, I needed to let her know that we knew what the truth is. At that point, the agent testified. Julia confessed to her that she used some of the heroin Brad brought her within a few hours of him leaving. Later, she said, Noah soiled his diaper and needed a bath, so she put him in the tub and evidently passed out, leaving him unattended. When she woke up, she told the agent she discovered Noah had struck his head and drowned in the bathtub. Julia told Agent Ludovico that she tried giving Noah CPR, but when she realized it wouldn't work, she moved him to his bed and shut the door to his bedroom. It was at this time that the Knowles came to visit, which would explain why she refused to let them peek in. Agent Ludovico also testified that Julia had told her she put Noah's body in an empty Huggies box and wrapped the box in black plastic trash bags Tim Carter brought her before asking him to dispose of the package. The nature of Julia and Tim's relationship is unclear, although they appear to have known each other for years, and it is unknown if Tim knew what was in the package when he threw it into a dumpster at the nearby Armistead Townhouse's development. Tim has not been charged in Noah's case. Detective Chapman testified after Julia's arrest on June 28th she asked specifically to speak with him and told him, despite what she had just told the FBI agent, that Noah was still alive. Chapman testified, She said that the statements she gave the FBI were to prove a point. At the end of the three-hour probable cause hearing, the judge ruled that there was sufficient evidence to support the charges against Julia and that a grand jury would be the next body to review them. Julia Leanna Tomlin was indicted on Monday, January 6, 2020, by a Hampton Circuit Court grand jury. 35-year-old Julia was indicted on a total of six felony counts, including second-degree murder. Her other charges include concealing a dead body, three counts of felony child neglect regarding Noah, Sammy, and Cheyenne, and a newly leveraged count of child abuse involving Noah that apparently took place two days before he was reported missing. Prosecutor Anton Bell said, We had one additional charge based on the prior injuries to the child prior to his death. During a court hearing on the morning of Friday, January 10th, Judge Michael Gayton scheduled a jury trial to take place in Hampton Circuit Court from March 9th through 13th. Julia's attorney, Althea Mees, told Judge Gayton that she was seeking a bench trial, meaning Julia's case would be decided by a judge without a jury present. Prosecutor Anton Bell told the judge that the prosecution would prefer a jury trial, and because one side requested such, Julia's case will be decided by a jury. Instead of the beginning of Julia's murder trial, on Monday, March 9th, her trial was put on hold pending the result of a mental competency evaluation. At a brief hearing in Hampton Court, Althea Mees told the court that for a number of reasons they didn't want to go to trial without a competency hearing, and since prosecutors didn't object, the request was granted. 
Again, Julia has previously been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, attention deficit disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as known issues with drugs and alcohol. Julia's competency hearing is scheduled for 9 a.m. on May 20, 2020, in Hampton Circuit Court, at which time her new trial date may be set. If I had to make a prediction, I'd say she'll be found competent to stand trial and will start sniffing around for a plea deal, like Joanne Cunningham did last year, pleading guilty to the murder of her five-year-old son, A.J. Frund. Whether Julia decides to go to trial or takes a plea bargain, my sincere hope is that the outcome of the trial truly brings justice for Noah, who didn't deserve the life he got. He deserved the world and so much more. Whenever I get updates, I'll post them on sufferthelittlechildrenblog.com, so keep an eye out there. And if you haven't, like me on Facebook at facebook.com slash sufferthelittlechildrenpod and facebook.com slash sufferthelittlechildrenblog for updates. That's it for today's episode, guys. Tune in next week for another case. Please subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com, where you can listen to episodes, leave a voicemail, and become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive show merch. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and Tumblr at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod, and on Twitter at STLCPod. I've posted a photo album for today's case on Facebook and Instagram. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. You can also read about today's case as well as many others at sufferthelittlechildrenblog.com. This podcast was written and produced by Lane. Music and sound effects for the show were created using sounds from audiojungle.com. Always remember, hug your babies a bit closer tonight. Until next week, bye guys. <laughs>